please welcome John Yearwood of Politico and our esteemed panel. Good morning, everyone. As we uh, kick off this uh, second and final day of the summit, uh, we'll start with a, what I think would be an enlightening and hopefully lively conversation about Latin America's economy. I'd like to introduce my two panelists. Uh, first of all, Marisol Agueda, Agueda de Berrias uh, from the World Economic Forum, and Dr. Juan Jose Dabu from Huge Business and Investment Council. Uh, let's start uh, with our conversation. You mind if we start with you, Marisol, about what do you see as, for, actually first give us an overall view uh, from you of the Latin American economy at this point. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Thank you so much to, for having me participate in this very important panel on the opportunities to improve economic growth in Latin America. Let me start by saying that Latin America is very heterogeneous. We cannot compare economies. Economies in Latin America have different structures and have a different sort of performance, different challenges, different also risks. So I think this is important to acknowledge. Now, we tend to measure some of the regional performance and some economic indicators with standardized approaches. What we see is a region that it had quite a good performance as it rebounded from the pandemic. It also continued with some moderate growth in 2022, but as commodity prices are decreasing and some other contexts are also making our economic situation a bit more complex, it, the forecast for Latin American growth in average is of 2% for next year. And in that 2%, you have a very varied type of a, uh, performance. You have, for example, Guyana, who grew around 49% in last year with a perspective of growth of 25% this year with huge opportunities that's, for that's investment. That's what happens when they discover oil in the economy. Exactly, right? and, but with, <laughs> with, and a, having um, such a commodity as a driver of growth. You can see some countries like Qatar in the Middle East and others that did make a very positive, constructive use a, to a, lay out the foundations for, for a prosperous society. And I hope Guyana follows that path. On the other side of the spectrum, you have a forecasts, for example, for, for Chile, a great economy that a, is the one only economy that was forecasted to contract. However, the last report from the central bank shows that last month, Chile grew a 0.4%. Copper is a great asset that they have, and copper is not yet to be substituted in the development of, of the new technologies and the devices that we use. So you know, that's interesting because I, I want us to talk about Chile mm -hmm. a, a, a little bit later, but I wanted to give uh, Dr. Debu a, a, an opportunity to just give us a sense from you, of sort of an overview of how uh, Latin America is, will be growing or not uh, during 23. Yeah, so uh, Marisol has painted a fantastic picture of uh, what Latin America looks like and how the numbers are. Let me just uh, add to something that she said in comparing two countries, two economies like Chile and Guyana, and that is that if we look at the picture today, indeed those are the numbers, but we have to see the whole movie, and countries, certain countries are much better prepared because they have institutions that work, they have done the reforms that have opened their economies, they have attracted investments primarily from the private sector, and they have reduced the size of the state. So, in those terms, those countries who have done the work, who have done the reforms, independently of how good or bad they are doing this year, they are in a much better position to take advantage of the opportunities that exist today, as opposed to those other countries that have not done the homework and might not be able to reap the benefits of the opportunities. What is one of them? One of them, and the one that, as we move in the panel, I'll dive in in more detail, is the trade or commercial tension that exists between the United States and China, which is here to stay. That brings a fantastic opportunity for Latin America and 
I would argue, for Latin America, for Central America, and within Central America, for the Northern Triangle of Central America, uh, for, to attract those companies that are going out of China, they are going to Vietnam, to Bangladesh, to other places, why not come into Latin America and to Central America in particular? That's a really good point, and I know that there's a panel that's coming up later talking about near sourcing, and, that's, and I want us to talk about that as well uh, in a minute. But I want to go back uh, to Marisol, talking about some of the, uh, the risks that we see uh, in, in Latin America uh, this year. What, what, what do you, how would you characterize those risks? Well, Juan Jose mentioned the importance of strong institutions. I think one of the highest risks that we see in surveys is political risk. We not only have pendular movements in the electoral cycles in Latin America that create uncertainties, but and good that we have elections and that we still have a, some strong democracies in Latin America, but that lack of a long-term vision that provides uncertainty for investments is one of the risks that creates some anxiety in, in potential a, a investors in the region. And not only the, the, the electoral cycle, but there is a, a huge polarization in our societies. There is social unrest. There are many social demands that have not been able to be addressed. And it becomes more and more difficult for governments alone to address those demands uh, with the fiscal gaps that we exist and the levels of indebtedness. So it's important, I believe, also to acknowledge that a, the, the relevance of bringing the private sector together in collaboration with governments to address those social economic deficiencies that have structurally a, impacted Latin America and that we have not yet been able to address. Another a, type of risk is the risk of environmental the lack of environmental well, resilience. Before you go to environmental, I just want to go back for a minute to hold the political risk that you're talking. I mean, you've got the top six economies in the region, which accounts for about 80% of GDP. They're all leftist countries. How concerned should uh, investors and others looking at Latin America be about that? Well, there is an election in Argentina in October, later in October. There's an election in Paraguay and another one in Guatemala this year. Um, so we had a, a, our annual meeting at Davos this year. It, presidents from the countries that you mentioned were present there, and they pledged for a uh, continued strengthening of democratic institutions. There will be obviously a shift in policies, uh, addressing more of the social demands, which is part of the political platform that is led by those governments, and, and that is that is good, that is positive, as long as the economy is also competitive, that it remains a, competitive, a productive economy, that incentives are created for the private sector to be efficient and to create jobs. So if, if that balance is created, I think we will be able to sort this out. Let me go to Dr. Debo. This, the, the whole idea of, you know, as Mar Marisol said, the leaders were at Davos uh, a few months ago and they all were pledging to do some of the right things. Uh, lip service? Or uh, do you believe that, um, you know, in those countries particularly, uh, we'll see um, some economic um, progress? Yeah, so uh, as Marisol mentioned, we have to look at uh, the role of the private sector in this equation. And I say that because I had the opportunity while I was at the World Bank to work in 110 countries around the world, all of Africa, all of the Middle East, all of Asia and Latin America. And this is the conversation that is taking place in all countries around the world. And we tend to circumscribe the conversation around the kind of government or leadership that exists, which of course is very important because that determines country risk. But then, one should take a look at it and say, look, governments are temporary, with some exceptions that like to stay longer, but governments are temporary, and the private sector is permanent. So we need to use that as the entry point that can help, on one hand, create jobs, and on the other hand, to 
strengthen the institutions that are needed for those jobs to be created. For example, in the case of the Northern Triangle of Central America, there are, depending which numbers you take, about one million people that migrate from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador to the United States every year. In our companies, in my family, in El Salvador, we don't find people to work. So the problem is on both sides. And then families are also separated. We need to address that by creating jobs. So in spite of who is really in government, and I'm not saying that is not important, that is very important, but in spite, whether you like it or don't like it, at the end of the day, you have to look then at the sector risk where you want to invest and you want to make sure that the rules are clear, that you can repatriate capital, that you can do the investments that are not short-term high return because those investments are short term, we want longer term types of investment. And I think more and more, we have here a former president Lacalle of Uruguay. Uruguay is doing a fantastic job. Uh, Dominican Republic is doing a, a great job at the same time. Uh, Ecuador is, is, is trying. In Central America, the three countries are making an effort to attract investment. We are doing conferences in Guatemala, in Honduras, in, in El Salvador to show them in real life what is taking place. I want to get to your, the point you wanted to make about near, near sourcing in a little bit, but before that, I want to come back um, and talk about, you started talking earlier about climate change and what impact that, uh, that will have on the region. If you can um, uh, talk about that. Yes, let me just add to Juan Jose's point on job creation. I think it's very, very important to understand where markets are going, where the economies are going, how digitalization is impacting the job market, in, in that sense, it's very, very important that we skill, reskill, and upskill labor so that we're able to attract the, the type of jobs that a, not only bring better wages and more benefits, but that incentivize people to stay in their home countries. At the same time, this is where the future of jobs is going. This is where new jobs will be created. And we do not want to lag in that area. We have great unicorns born in, in, in Latin America. And many of those have to go out and seek for the type of high, um, high capacity, highly skilled uh, workers outside of the region. So it's very, very important to accompany um, program or policies that incentivize also that uh, upskilling and reskilling of people. To the, uh, the point on climate change, it's, it's very, very important to understand the cyclical impact of natural disasters that uh, create a huge reverse in any type of uh, advance that we make, not only economically, but there's also uh, an evidence that many of those migrants or uh, displaced people are also uh, transiting due to natural disasters or to the lack of environmental resilience. And it's thus very important to understand as well that there's a great opportunity to develop a green economy. The bioeconomy is a billion dollar economy. We have vast natural uh, resources throughout Latin America. This is the time to leverage that when consumers are demanding more sustainability in all of the value chain, and where the young consumers are also expecting a better a low carbon transportation, sustainable goods, and that is becoming an important factor that Latin America can leverage. You know, but I have to ask you though, uh, and, uh, about the whole idea of climate change and um, what's happening um, in the region. China is one of the region's uh, biggest um, financial backers, but at the same time, some people would tell you in some parts of the regions, they're doing really severe uh, environmental damage. Uh, how do you square that? Well, that, that, is, that is partly true, but it's also true that we have in South America the Amazon, which is the most important environmental asset uh, globally. And this is a uh, global good that we need to take care of, but at the same time that there should be conservation plans, we should also care about the people that live in the Amazon and create uh, a green economy around those people so that they are able to uh, remain in those areas and that we are able to uh, keep the Amazon as an important global asset. 
When people think of the Amazon, we think of a forest. There's 42 billion, million people, sorry, 42 million people living in the Amazon with huge diversity. So I, I believe it's very important to focus on that as well. Dr. Deba, can we talk for a minute about near sourcing? A lot of people are talking about it, and I mentioned China earlier, and you mentioned China as well. Is that the magic bullet, bullet that the region needs? Uh, so I think it's a fantastic opportunity. If you look at uh, the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years, every 10 years there is something in fashion. You know, we're going to do something in infrastructure. We're going to do something in technology. We're going to do something in this area. And many countries do take advantage, do the right reforms in the countries to enable the environment to attract those investments, and others just let those opportunities go all the way from the Industrial Revolution. So today, nearshoring is indeed here and I think it's gonna stay for quite some time. And it is in areas where we are ready, in Latin America and in Central America in particular, to participate. In other words, while I agree 100% with Marisol that you know, uh, we, we would love to have uh, more jobs on uh, artificial intelligence and on expert systems and high technology uh, um, uh, investments, the fact of the matter is that we do not yet have the numbers in terms of the human capital. So we need to prepare it, and that takes some time. As a matter of fact, at HUGE, which stands for Honduras, US, Guatemala, and El Salvador, uh, we are uh, uh, supporting a program that is training 10,000 people in Honduras in textiles, but not the traditional textile, but a lot of value added to the point that there are people being trained that are working in factories in Switzerland with where equipment is being built for this industry in particular. So you are adding a little bit more value. These are 10,000 people being trained by NC State and by other universities in the US, plus local uh, uh, institutions. I say this to say that the near sharing opportunity is there, but we also need to do a lot of homework. And one of the most important homework that we need to do is building the infrastructure that will make us compete beyond labor. If 10% of the current manufacturing of textiles, just to continue that example, that takes place in China was to move to any of our countries, that's one million new jobs, with only 10% of the textile manufacturing that takes place in China. So we are not talking about sophisticated stuff. We are talking about things that we are already and have been for many years producing. So there is a, an important chance there. However, a container, in the case of Central America, to travel from Panama to Guatemala takes on average drives at about 15 to 18 miles per hour. When in the United States and in Europe, that is between 45 and 50 miles. We cannot be competitive if we don't have the infrastructures or if we have the borders and the customs that are not working. So at HUGE, we have identify some $4.2 billion worth of investments in roads, airports, um, energy, telecom, in order to enable the environment for these companies to move and have the labor capability and to have the infrastructure that will make it as competitive as from where they are currently located. So, short answer, near shoring is indeed an opportunity, but we shouldn't take it like we have in the past, we really need to do our homework, and one of the most important is to remove the cholesterol of the infrastructure that currently exists in order for the flow to be much, much efficient. Hey, look, I want to take advantage of this unique opportunity to have two El Salvadorians uh, on stage. I want to ask you a, a question or two about what's happening there, but before I do that, though, let me ask you about <clears throat> the United States. And, and whether, if you look at, uh, a lot of people have said for, for a long time that the U.S. should do more in Latin America. What, what's your perception of, uh, and your take on, uh, on what the Biden administration has been doing in the region, and do you think it's enough? We'll start with you, Marisol. Thank you, John. The Biden administration has created under Vice President Harris a specific program, the Partnership for Central America, that is seeking to address the root causes of migration by creating better socioeconomic opportunities and enhancing environmental resilience in the northern countries of Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. There is important pledges made for investments to come and adding, uh, building on, on Juan Jose's point, 
another immediate area where we have a great opportunity to create jobs is on BPOs, call centers. If some are already skilling a Central Americans in the English language so that they can participate in uh, those kind of services. But the Spanish speaking market is huge. There's 30 million Hispanic consumers or Spanish speaking consumers only in the United States. And we have all of Latin America except for Brazil that also speaks Spanish. So uh, I think this is one important area of opportunity that is uh, being addressed under the partnership as well. Uh, doing more, I, I, I think nearshoring is the word, but we need also to be prepared from our side. The US needs to create the incentives, the conditions to uh, privilege Latin America over other geographies. Excellent. Uh, one has a, what, 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 what's your? So I think the United States regrettably is leaving all the room for the China for China and the Chinese, and that is not what we should be ambitioning. I'll give you an example. Uh, the last war of the Cold War was fought in El Salvador. And thanks to President Reagan, the then Pope John Paul II, and the resilience of the Salvadorian people, we stopped communism there, okay? At that time, the country was totally destroyed. Zero credibility, 90% of the infrastructure destroyed. 22% of our population migrated to the United States. About 5% of the population was killed or directly impacted. Yet, we were able to turn things around and in a period of six years, we became investment grade, second only to Chile. At that time, A, investment was coming, B, less immigration took place to the United States. So the answer to your question is there needs to be a strong leadership in the United States that recognizes the real partnership that has to exist, not only because of, on one side, the issue of immigration, which is very relevant, but on the other, for geopolitical reasons, because you have an actor that is not as friendly to the United States and shouldn't be with the relevance that it is and taking and growing farther, in my opinion. Yeah, look, we've got just like two minutes left, unfortunately, but I've got to ask you to take advantage of the fact that you're both from El Salvador. Uh, we've seen a growth in El Salvador at around 2%, and there's some more optimistic numbers for this year, but at the same time, according to my friend Andres Oppenheimer and others, the country is getting, or at least the president is getting increasingly autocratic. Does that give him a pass to uh, uh, the, the economic growth to continue some of the autocratic policies we've seen. Um, uh, Juan Jose, I don't know if you want to take that first. So, You've got about uh, a minute each. <laughs> so I, I think it is very important to uh, pay attention to what I said before. Salvadorian people are extremely resilient and we have been able to encounter all kinds of challenges, whether it is from climate to political instability. And I gave you an example of what happened in my country at that time. After that, we have had the leftists, the Communist Party in government during two periods, and we have had a populist from the right, which was right after 2004. That, so we have had all kinds of governments, yet the Salvadorian people continue to work and continue to work very hard. I think that Today, there needs to be an even stronger relationship between the private sector and the government to take advantage of what is taking place. And I have no doubt that it is in everybody's interest to achieve that. Yep. Uh, I can only endorse uh, Juan Jose's brilliant answer. But let me rather focus again on the opportunity that the Americas have. It, we need bipartisan support to have a long-term vision, a stable, policy among the Americas. We can no longer continue to be just spectators of the continued success in Asia or the thriving interest that there is in Africa now that they're announcing the Pan-African trade integration system. I would like to end with a call to action. I think this is a time where the Americas should focus on what brings us together rather than what divides us. And for that, we need everyone to have a clarity of vision, the determined 
commitment uh, to make the changes that need to be made in our region and take the opportunities that lie right in front of us. Fantastic. Well, we're just about out of time. Everyone, please join me in thanking these two brilliant panelists. Thank you.